my name is Chris Kinsler. Good morning. And uh, I'm a land resource specialist at the St. John's of the Water Management District Bureau of Land Resources. Thank you for joining us today for the Northern Recreation Public Meeting Weather. We'll be reviewing our land management updates, uh, the proposed recreation rule changes, as well as having an opportunity for public comment. Joining us today is Amy Topo, our West Region Land Manager, signed by the manual our Bureau Chief, myself, uh, Chris Kinsler, and uh, Laura LeBerg, our Public Communications Coordinator, who's facilitating this meeting. And, uh, Sorry, uh, Tyler Mostel, our uh, North Region. Also, we now have Caleb Clark, Paul Hudson, and Jerry, Jeremy Olson on during the public comment session. This is an answer. This is the agenda for today's meeting. And we'll, we'll go over uh, the, the meeting format, our, our goals, our goal for the meeting, the properties covered, as well as some ground rules. We'll also uh, have an introductory poll real quick and kind of get some, some feedback as far as this method of this, uh, which I'll do on district plans as well as uh, see if he's time for that. Then we'll go into the, the North Region planning of an update uh, recording with Todd Mosteller. And then the West Region one of an update also with uh, Amy Copeland. I'll come back and give a recreation rules evaluation. And then a prime primary of the chief will introduce public comment. And then we'll have a public comment period and we'll wrap up the recording. Your participation is key for this public uh, for the public meeting, this webinar. We have many ways for you to provide comment. Um, make sure your computer audio is, is on, and that's the best way to make sure that you hear everything. Um, you can either, there's three ways that you can provide comment. You can use the raise your hand button on, on the dashboard on the side, and I'll acknowledge you, and then you can, uh, and I'll mute you, and then you can have further comment through that. You can also write your question in the question panel, and I will respond to that and post it, and it's just post the, the, the answer will come up for everybody to see. Or you can email Northern Recreational Comments at sjrwmd.com. I'll be monitoring that email account throughout. And if any, if any questions or comments come through that email, I'll leave them out and then put the answers on some of the This meeting is being recorded and including all public comment. Anyone who wishes to remain anonymous will not be recorded and may speak with staff afterwards or submit written comments in the questions panel. Or email and information comments at SJRWMD. The purpose uh, for this district, the uh, purpose for this meeting is for the district to receive a uh, public comment regarding recreation utilization. And the lands that will be covered, the properties that will be covered today are listed here. And uh, the northern region covers uh, several counties in north, northeast Florida, including. Nassau, Duval, Clay, St. John's, Putnam, and North Flyford. And the West Region covers uh, Alachua County, parts of Marion, and Putnam. And I will put the email in the chat right here. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. That's a good idea. And with that, we'll go into a couple of polls and then we'll go into presentation. So, the first one is how many Northern Recreation Public Meetings have you?
All right. Looks like this is, this is, the, um, this is your first one. So it's uh, glad to hear. What's your favorite activity on this land? So that's a good mix. It seems like uh, about 42% biking and hiking and about 40% of fishing, and then also wildlife here. And how often do you visit district lands in the year? Oh yeah, pretty good distribution. And which time that works best for you for this uh, uh for the RPM? Excellent. Yes, yeah, so it seems like this time works for everybody, but there are some uh, good options as well for later in the day. So with that, that thanks for all that information. And um, we're going to go ahead and start the northern region and recreation public meeting presentation and the land management update. Good day. My name is Tyler Mosteller, and I'm the new land manager for the North Region here at the district. I've been back at the district for about five weeks now and have gotten myself up to speed as much as possible in that time, but I'm sure there are a few things that have happened over the past year that I will find out about in the coming months. At the end of the presentation, I can try to answer any questions to the best of my ability, but may need some help. Uh, input from other land managers uh, to do so, so bear with me. So the north region spans over a seven county area bounded to the north and east by the state line in the Atlantic Ocean. We go as far west as Baker County and as far south as the northern portion of Flagler County. We're the lead manager for 19 different properties across that area, totaling roughly 42,000 acres. And we will possibly take the lead on all of 12 Mile Swamp in the next three years, which will add around 18,000 acres to our area. We currently have a staff of three, including me and a land management specialist and an invasive technician. We have a land management technician position open and we'll hopefully have that filled soon and be fully staffed at four people. Prescribed fire is the most cost effective and best management tool for managing most lands in Florida. And here in the North region, we were able to burn 1,742 acres over the last year, and that was over eight burn days. Uh, at the Bayard Conservation Area, we got 462 acres burned. Uh, 125 acres at the Black Creek Ravines Conservation Area. 795 acres at the Moses Creek Conservation Area and 360 acres at the Julington Durban Preserve. This wasn't as much as we would like to have, but there was only a staff of one here from October to March of this past year. Uh, that was the current land management specialist. Uh, did a great job, um, but we are looking to get a lot more burn acreage in this coming year. We had three wildfires last year, totaling approximately nine acres. Two were at the Thomas Creek Conservation Area, one on the Ogilvy Betts Tract, and the other on the Red Shirt Farms Tract. 
the other fire was on Moses Creek, and the fire at Ogilvy Betts was the largest at around 6.8 acres. We did not have any timber harvest over the last year in the north region, but we are getting ready to start one at the Bayard Conservation Area and also one at the Black Creek Conservation Area and uh, possibly looking into having another one at the Moses Creek Conservation Area. So uh, this upcoming year uh, we'll be uh, busy in the timber harvests. Moving along with forest management, we didn't have any timber plantings of significant size as we didn't have many timber harvests uh, last year. So at the Gord Island Conservation, though, we did have three acres of containerized longleaf pine hand planted. Uh, this was in the northwest corner where we contracted a mowing project a few years prior. Region-wide last year, we treated approximately 489 acres of invasive or problematic plants over 10 properties. At Bayard Conservation Area, we concentrated on Kogan grass and Chinese tallow. And at the Black Creek Ravines Conservation Area, we hit hardwoods that were encroaching on the sand hills, uh, which were too big to kill with fire. By getting rid of the hardwoods, we can promote grass species, which will allow us to maintain these declining habitats with fire, as fire doesn't burn under the oaks very well. A common method we use for controlling the hardwoods and uh, other problematic trees is known as the hack and spray, or also known as the hack and squirt method. To do this, we use a machete to cut into the bark around the tree and spray herbicide around that entire circumference of the trunk within the cuts. The picture on the bottom right of the slide shows how the hack and spray method works. At the Julington Durban Preserve, we went after Kogan grass, Japanese climbing fern, and hardwoods encroaching on the sand hills, similar to how we did for the Black Creek ravines. Julington Durban is another property with uh, really high quality sandhill habitat that we need to protect. At Moses Creek, we concentrated on tropical soda apple and Chinese tallow. Chinese tallow has always been an issue at Moses Creek, but this is the first I've known about tropical soda apple showing up. Uh, hopefully we got it all and don't have to worry about it again. At Murphy Creek Conservation Area, we had a smaller Kogan grass infestation that was likely brought in from contaminated equipment. We treated the Kogan grass along with a relatively large infestation of camphor tree. Uh, at Pelliser Creek Conservation Area, we concentrated on Kogan grass in the uplands and Brazilian pepper along the marsh edges associated with the Pelliser Creek drainage. Brazilian pepper is becoming more common in North Florida every year and is one we have to be vigilant about killing as soon as we find it on an area we manage. At Thomas Creek, we treated Japanese climbing fern. Uh, Japanese climbing fern is one of those that likes wetter areas and it likes to grow in many of the ditches and wetlands out there. I consider things such as mechanical treatments in natural areas, sometimes herbicide, uh, to be land maintenance, not so much prescribed burning. Last year we maintained fences in the north region mostly by repairing them after being damaged, but the Bayard Conservation Area had miles of fence that was being overtaken by brush and small trees. So to avoid damage from vegetation encroaching on the fence, we treated the fence lines uh, with herbicide. At Stokes Landing Conservation Area, we contracted a large brush mowing project. We were hoping to get prescribed fire going on the property in the near future, but it had been so long since the last burn that the understory vegetation had grown to the point where the fuel loading was too high to confidently burn without killing overstory trees. In addition, there were also residences adjoining the property, so preventing an intense and dangerous wildfire from occurring was another goal of that project. We have three conservation areas in the north region open for hunting. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission administrates the hunts on most all public lands in the state of Florida. Uh, that makes them a big cooperator of ours. Uh, to be able to hunt on one of the areas in the north region, hunters must apply for a permit through the FWC licensing system and then win it through a random drawing. Our properties are popular amongst hunters. Our land management practices promote healthy and robust game populations and hunters are aware of this. 
Additionally, our huntable lands receive less pressure than many other public lands because of that permitting system, making them even more popular, especially for hunters looking for a hunt where there is less of a chance of someone walking up on them while they're uh, hunting. The Florida Forest Service, Flagler County, and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection assist us on fires, and we return the favor by assisting them as well. It is a good system and promotes camaraderie between individuals working in the fire realm, as well as continually allowing burners to gain more experience and learn new techniques. Multiple local governments cooperate with us on managing our lead areas. Typically, we take care of the land management needs and they handle recreational amenities. For example, the Thomas Creek Conservation Area Logan Tract and the Julington Durban Preserve is co-managed by the city of Jacksonville. They take care of the trail maintenance and sanitary services and the district handles things like burning or timber management. Special use authorizations are approved by the district when requested if the request doesn't interfere with our land management practices or it's not something that uh, goes against district policy. We have everything from recreational groups to researchers looking to use district lands to meet their needs. A few examples of approved special use authorizations include uh, wildlife research, uh, recreational mountain biking clubs, running association races, or Eagle Scouts looking to perform volunteer projects. There are multiple lease agreements that are maintained throughout the district and the North region pertaining to the use of district land. Some of the most popular in the North region are apiary sites and cattle leases. We have apiary sites on multiple North region properties and cattle leases on two of our areas. Security issues are non-stop when managing public lands, and the district's North Region properties are no exception. We come across everything from robbery to nudists jogging down our trails. Fences sometimes are cut or gates are ripped out of the ground on occasion, and we deal with a lot of ATV trespass and illegal dumping. We have remote cameras, uh, which are shown in the bottom right picture on the slide, that we can place those in problem areas and it assists law enforcement or our contracted security firm uh, with evidence collection for either uh, making a case, writing a citation, or even prosecution. Uh, we also maintain a contract with 1-800-GOT-JUNK for helping haul off any of the refuse that people dump on our properties. Uh, interesting story, one of the more recent things that uh, has been found uh, was at the Julington Durban Preserve. If you look at the top left picture of the slide, that is actually a big workout setup with a weight bench and grass mats put down. Uh, I think they had some things hanging on the trees. Uh, but as you can see all the way around it, it is black. We burnt that unit and uh, the land management specialist found this setup out there in the middle of the preserve. Uh, we used one of the cameras that uh, we have and put it up and, and caught the, uh, the guys going back and forth. They, they had brought all that stuff out from a townhome complex uh, that was just adjacent to the property and uh, our law enforcement uh, our contracted security firm has deputized law enforcement agents. They came out there and actually got the kids um, and had them haul all of that off the property and uh, take it back home. So interesting stuff. You never know what you're going to see. I appreciate your time and can take any questions now if anyone has any. All right, well, uh, we'll hold questions towards the end, and now we will go to uh, the West Region, a land management update. Good morning. My name is Amy Copeland, and I'm the land manager for the West Region of the St. Johns River Water Management District. And I'm going to present a land management update for all the land management related activities that have occurred from March of last year to March of this year. The West Land Management Region of the St. Johns River Water Management District is comprised of seven different conservation areas located in eastern Alachua, Putnam, 
and North Marion counties. These conservation areas include our Noonan's Lake Conservation Area at about 9,000 acres, our Longleaf Flatwoods Reserve at 2,000 acres, our Loch Lusa Wildlife Conservation Area at 11,000 acres, our Orange Creek Restoration Area at 3,000 acres, our Rice Creek Restoration Area at 9,000 acres, our Black Sink Prairie Conservation Area at 600 acres, and our Silver Springs Forest Conservation Area, which is about 4,500 acres. The district has lead management responsibility for these conservation areas and balances multi-use public recreational access in conjunction with our management goals and objectives, which include restoration and ecological maintenance. We do this all in conjunction with the district's core mission of providing water quality protection, water supply, and flood control. One of the most important and effective ecological maintenance tools that the district employs on its conservation lands is the use of prescribed fire. And then the last year, the West Region Land Management staff has spent over 19 days on fires in the region and accomplished over 3,000 acres of prescribed burning the effects of which are uh, present on multiple conservation areas with very, very high quality, well-conducted prescribed burns. Um, and the benefits of that are natural cleansing of the forest by a natural process applied by skilled practitioners in a safe way. Um, it, it benefits wildlife and native plants and maintains a good, healthy forest structure all while also reducing hazardous fuel buildups that if a natural wildfire were to be ignited uh, would hopefully prevent those wildfires from burning as intensely as if the fires had not occurred uh, previously. And speaking of wildfires, we did experience uh, one wildfire in the last year at our Silver Springs Forest Conservation Area back in January of this year of 2022. It was a small wildfire. It was caught early, detected early by our Marion County and Florida Forest Service partners. Uh, it only got to about 1.4 acres in size before it was contained. And then uh, West Region staff mopped it up for several days after and minimal negative effects as a result of that fire. Another really important management tool that the district employs on several of its conservation areas is the practice of select timber thinning. And the West Region has had a very active year of managing timber cell contracts. And um, these civil cultural harvesting activities are uh, both profitable for the district as well as extremely beneficial to overall stand health and uh, forest composition. And uh, there are many benefits of which uh, include uh, fuel reduction, uh, opening up the stand uh, to increase the diversity of ground cover species, um, as well as just overall improved forest health. A lot of our lands were formerly industrial civicultural land prior to district purchase. And once the district acquired those lands, uh, those stands needed uh, a lot of management. And through several years of active civil cultural management, we are slowly converting a lot of these stands into a more natural uh, forest state and, and composition that supports a lot of really great wildlife and, and plant biodiversity. So. Um, just real quick on our Loch Lusa Wildlife Conservation Area, we have a, a few thinnings in progress, uh, individual different uh, timber sales that are being managed by regional staff. Uh, we have our North Quarter thinning at 179 acres. That's approximately 50% complete currently. We have our Cooter Bob Road combined with County Road 325 thinning that was 355 acres, and that's approximately 60% complete. Our longleaf thinning 
323 acres, and that's approximately 90% complete. And as I go through these slides, if you wonder, you know, what does 50% versus 90% complete mean? That basically just means the, the progression of the sale, you know, to completion, the, 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 the timber stand thinning completion. So uh, timber sales can start and then stop due to weather, adverse conditions on site, which, um, you know, the sale manager needs to go in and, and, and halt the sale temporarily to protect the ground and, and other resources. So um, just because we have a sale in progress doesn't mean within a few months it'll be completed. Weather and other adverse conditions could con temporarily stall the sale. So, all right, let's continue. At our Silver Springs Forest Conservation Area, we have a couple of logging operations going on. Um, our marked thinning sale has been uh, bid out. It's almost 70 acres. It has not yet started due to on-site wet conditions. Our fiscal year 20 thinning sale is 190 acres. It's only 5% complete. Um, we got started on it and then promptly got rained out. And our fiscal year 21 thinning, 380 acres, is 30% complete. And um, we're just waiting for conditions to dry on site before we're able to continue on with those logging operations. At our Rice Creek Conservation Area, a sale was uh, completed on our nine mile swamp thinning. It was 101 acres, it's 100% complete. And at our Noonan's Lake Conservation Area, we have our Noonan's grade thinning, it's 94 acres and it is 0% complete. It's waiting, waiting to start. Over the last year, West Region staff have been very active uh, working on ecological restoration and invasive plant species management. At Loch Lusa Wildlife Conservation Area, a staff have treated over 176 acres of encroaching hardwoods, and they have also treated uh, over 16 acres of torpedo grass, 32 acres of natal grass, um, a small amount of kogan grass was detected and treated as well, um, as well as some coral ardesia. And the importance of all this vigilance and rapid response to newfound infestations and constant scouting on the properties for invasive plants is, you know, find them early, hit them hard, and keep the infestation small and recheck because these plants can, uh, especially in some of our restoration areas where we have had um, a lot of work, um, these invasive plant species are very competitive and once they get in and get established, they can quickly outcompete our natives. So we have great staff uh, utilizing in-house staff and contractors that are very actively trying to search out, uh, treat, and, and watch for these invasive plant species. So they're doing a great job. And Loch has seen a lot of benefit as a result of their, their good work. Our staff have also been very active um, treating invasive plants throughout the region. At our Silver Springs Forest Conservation Area, they've treated almost 140 acres of kogan grass, almost four acres of camphor trees, over 70 acres of Chinese tallow trees, and 60 acres of Caesar weed. At our Orange Creek Restoration Area, they've got a whopping 332 acres of Caesar weed treated, 530 acres of Cuban bulrush out in the marshes. One acre of encroaching hardwoods was also treated, as well as uh, three acres of water hyacinths. At our Noonan's Lake Conservation Area, uh, we had over five acres of hardwood uh, treated and controlled. Two acres scouted and treated for coral ardesia as well as a tiny little infestation of kogan grass caught and treated early. At our Rice Creek Conservation Area, we had a small patch of kogan grass treated as well. And additionally, some of the ecological restoration efforts that West Region land management staff have continued 
um, over the last year include the uh, collection and planting of five acres of wiregrass seed on a site at our Longleaf Flatwoods Reserve that hopefully in the future will serve as a permanent seed source for our ongoing ground cover restoration projects. And um, here's staff um, loading the hoppers of our of our seed seeder and um, and then staff operating the tractor that uh, was working to seed these into our uh, prepped fields. And this project is also in coordination with the University of Florida um, and, a, and a research project that they're actively pursuing on site right now. So not only is uh, the University of Florida getting some really good research in, um, we're going to benefit as well by having a permanent source of, of wiregrass on site. A couple of the recreational infrastructure related uh, updates that we have to provide uh, include uh, repairs to the Burnt Island Pavilion at our Loch Lusa Wildlife Conservation Area. We had a couple of uh, damaged posts at our pavilion that were repaired recently. And also coming soon, we will hopefully be replacing the Burnt Island Road airboat crossing and get a little, little better structure there. Uh, the one that's currently there is about at the end of its usable life. So continuing on with public recreation and access, um, one of the things that we do is partner with other agencies such as the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to provide additional uh, public access and hunting opportunities. And currently, um, our conservation areas, we have we have four that are currently uh, designated as either WMAs, wildlife management areas, or public small game hunt areas. Uh, those properties are our Orange Creek Restoration Area, Loch Lusa Wildlife Management Area, the Hatchet Creek Tract of our Noonan's Lake Conservation Area, and our Silver Springs Forest Conservation Area. We also work with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and the National Wild Turkey Federation to serve as host sites for some of the youth, women, and field to fork hunts that occur annually. And these are really, really awesome opportunities for guided, mentored hunts on some of our properties that introduce uh, for the first time to some young folks and women um, hunting and woodsmanship skills and all that good stuff. So the district's really proud to participate that in that and, and have a role in supporting these awesome experiences for, for young and beginning hunters. It's really cool and it's an amazing program. Some additional interagency cooperation support that the district has provided includes um, assisting um, with the private landowner assistance uh, with some ground cover uh, planting through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as um, with the University of Florida, um, the district will collect uh, bulk wire grass seed for some of our ongoing restoration projects in exchange for some burn staff assistance when they, the University of Florida at Ordway Swisher Biological Station are conducting prescribed burns. So very, very good, mutually beneficial, uh, cooperative relationships occurring there. And that's gonna conclude my presentation on the land management update of the West Land Management Region. It's been a great year, um, a lot of great burning has occurred, a lot of great invasive plant management treatment um, and, and continued ecological restoration, ground cover restoration projects by a lot of really great staff here in this region, as well as excellent partners and cooperators that we are very fortunate to uh, work with. And so if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask now, I believe, or uh, my contact information is provided here if you would like to reach out in the future uh, with any questions um, or inquiries in the future. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. Yeah.
Thank you, Amy and Tyler. We will have one more presentation. We'll be talking about um, some recreation rules updates that we're proposing uh, district wide. Um, and we're going for that in this in this um, type of presentation. Right here. We're looking at district camping, change potential changes to district camping rules, as well as e-bike usage on district land. The district has 22 reservable campsites, eight of which are within the northern recreation areas. Uh, these are primitive campsites with no electricity or potable water. Um, some are, are hiking while most are driving. There is no fee and reservations must be made through the district website. Uh, RVs and camper vans are not allowed. The last new camping rule revision occurred over 20 years ago. And one of the updates that we are looking to conduct is um, changing the length of stay on the district campsites. Currently, a person can stay no greater than seven continuous days or 30 total days per year per district campsite. There have been instances where two or two people in a party are um, have reserved out a campsite for a month and then uh, moved to another campsite and, and do the same, blocking others from uh, having opportunities to reserve it. While not against the current rules, this does limit opportunities for other campers. So our proposed change is to is a limit, it's a per person limit of 30 days district wide as opposed to per district campsite. Our objective is to increase camping opportunities for the public. And, uh, and but this change has not gone into effect and we are looking for your comments. So uh, please email them to Northern Recreation Comments at SJRWMD.com or you can state them in our upcoming public comment section at the end of the month. In addition, uh, we are looking to add rules uh, regarding e-bike usage on district lands. Uh, we aim to mirror FWC's rules utilizing e-bike using utilizing the e-bike classifications codified in Florida statutes. And these classifications are um, a class one e-bike, which is capped at a uh, flame per hour, and they are a pedal assist bicycle, where you have to be pedaling in order for the electric motor to uh, engage. Uh, there are also class two e-bikes, um, where they have a flame per hour maximum, but they often have a throttle, like a thumb throttle, similar to an ATV. Um, and you don't need to be pedaling for these uh, for the motor to engage. And then also class three bikes, which are uh, higher mile per hour maximum, comes with eight miles per hour, but you have to be pedaling for them uh, to uh, engage. Oops. All right. So what are um, what FWC's rules and what we are proposing to uh, forth on district properties is having class one e-bikes which are the pedal assist bicycles with the lower mile per hour maximum they may uh, be allowed on our multi-use trails currently designated for bicycles the class two and three uh, the faster uh, bicycles or, or the ones that have a throttle may only be operated on district roads uh, that are currently open to registered motor vehicles such as some of the roads on a lot of wildlife conservation uh, allowing these class two or three district uh, um, bikes on district managed uh, multi-use trails may lead to environmental damage as well as legal conflicts or safety concerns. So with that, um, we'd like your input on any of uh, these of these potential changes, and um, please email us at Northern Recreation Comments or uh, answer your question here in a moment. Uh, Muted. Unmuted. So with that, um, I'm going to go turn this over to Brian Emanuel and uh, introduce him. And he will introduce our public comment section. Brian?
Hi, I'm uh, Brian Emanuel, the Chief of the Bureau of Land Resources for the Water Management District. And basically, I just want to thank everybody that's participating in this uh, uh, RPM. Uh, we do uh, record all the all the input from our constituents and Muted. very much appreciate people taking time out of their day uh, to come participate in this process. Uh, with that, I'm going to just let everybody know to you know make your comments in the comment section chris is going to manage the the comments and uh the staff here uh the applicable staff will will address the comments uh as necessary uh and you can also raise your hand and ask questions as well uh, once again thank you very much for your time and your input unmuted and also, I don't know if you mentioned it, Chris, I think you did, that, that we're going to be going back to live meetings after this one. I actually did not. I appreciate you reminding me. Unless, unless there's some big change in the, the world order of things, we will be going back to live meetings. Thank you. Um, Lauren, you had emailed a question uh, to the Lord of Recreation Comics. And if it didn't come through, um, I'm gonna put my email up there if you just want to hide on that one. I'll just be saying. Or if you want to just put in the in the comment um, the question and answer box as well. And, Yes, Fletcher. Um, what I'll do, I saw you just you asked if you could just do it over voice. If you can, um, since you uh, asked on there, what I'll do is I'll unmute you and then unmute yourself, and then um, I'll do my best to transcribe it. But you can go ahead and um, ask your question now. Hey, Chris, I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I assume everybody can hear me okay. Am I coming I through okay? Sir. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so I've got three different questions. First one is for you, Chris. Um, you talked about e-bikes. Is there any evidence of safety concerns or environmental damage that they've caused at other, not necessarily district lands, but other public lands across Florida? I think there's anecdotal stuff and, and just because evidence, just because of FWC having the need to uh, put forth rules. Um, I this that's from what I know. I don't know, uh, Brian or Jerry. Do you have any any other input? Um, things that you've heard, seen. I haven't heard anything specifically. I'm sure there's evidence out there. Um, uh, of. of the off-road use of them could be damaging, but I don't have any studies or anything like that to reference on the topic. They're becoming more and more popular, I will say. Uh, so um, it's, it's going to become. We, we have received complaints, I will say, recently uh, on the wildlife drive at Lake Apopka, which is a gravel wildlife drive that's open to drive-in traffic on uh, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, we have had a few complaints about, um, concerns, I should say, rather than complaints of e-bikes. Uh, you know, they're harder to see than the vehicles, and then they're, they're passing vehicles that are watching wildlife and that type of thing. It was uh, more of a concern. It was a safety concern complaint, I guess you would call it. Um, but nothing bad has happened that we know of. So with that wildlife drive at Lake Apopka, the way I understand the proposed rule is if that rule went through, it wouldn't change how e-bikes are allowed to use that drive, right? Because no. vehicles are already Correct. allowed there. Okay. Correct. Yeah. All right. I, I appreciate that, guys. Um, second question I've got for um, Amy Copeland. Um, Amy, can you talk a little more about the aquatic vegetation management at Orange Creek? And the goals of that management. 
Yep. Um, sure. Yep. So I've been the manager since January in this region. And from what I understand, the previous year, um, they conducted a large muted mechanical harvesting removal and, and have had ongoing um, herbicide control treatments as well because of the very large infestation of Cuban um, bulrush out there that is uh, exponentially increasing and, and rapidly choking out parts of what used to be the open water parts of the marsh. So um, we also deal with water hyacinths and uh, a few other encroaching types of vegetation. But um, so I'm not quite sure the acreage uh, that was treated last year, I want to say probably in the range of Chris, you can, you know, feel free, probably a hundred or a couple hundred acres of tussocks. Um, but um, going forward this year, we're going to be doing similar harvesting and treatment activities as well to, to try to tackle those, those tussocks that are continuing to expand out there. Awesome. Thanks, Amy. I appreciate that. I'm a big duck hunter, so that's music to my ears. Um, and I should have probably introduced myself before. I apologize, guys. My name is Fletcher Hallett. Um, I'm a resident of St. John's County, a homeowner and a business owner, also an avid outdoorsman. Um, I appreciate all of the staff coming and, and being at the meeting and explaining stuff to everybody. Thank you. Um, and Chris, I've got actually two more questions. Should I go ahead with it now? I'm Unmuted. Too much time. Yeah, you got the floor. So, uh, okay. I appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure who to ask this question to, but are there plans to enroll more district lands in the WMA system? I know uh, you were in contact with, with, with Jeremy and uh, myself. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, yeah. It's Brian, email. Uh, we're, we are con considering a few more properties for that. We haven't, um, I, ha I haven't had time to talk with our assistant ED uh, and director to you know, get the flavor for that uh, willingness to expand our WMA footprint. But there's a few properties that that we're considering uh, suggesting for that. It just said we just haven't gone there yet. It's on the it's on the it's on the radar. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Um, I live in Hastings, uh, which is kind of the southwest corner of St. John's County. Um, I'm about a half a mile or so from the Deep Creek boat ramp right there at 207. Just before Hastings, uh, just on the east side of Hastings, um, I think that'd be a really cool property to have a WMA opened at. It, it would allow us to have a water access spot in um, kind of in this area. I know there's one in in Duval and and Nassau County, but um, that property would seems to me like it'd be a great spot. There's not a lot of recreation out there. I run out there a lot, but I don't see a lot of people recreating. You know, other horseback riders or or runners or bikers. Um, there's just not a whole lot of trails, and it's somewhat wet. Um, and I think also just kind of something to keep in mind for the staff, you know, one of your goals is flood control. And as some of you may know, Deep Creek kind of flood, um, drains all of Hastings and the surrounding communities there. Um, in Hurricane Irma, from what I understand, the reason that Hastings had so much flooding problems was because the water couldn't get out of Deep Creek because of so many trees that were down. I think having a water access spot there would you just kind of naturally have trees get cut away and stuff like that to open up Deep Creek to allow for better access from hunters. Um, so I think it'd, it'd be mutually beneficial to us because we'd love to have, you know, an extra place to hunt. It'd be a cool place because water access, you know, would help the staff out with, you know, having staffing issues, not able to, to clear that creek and keep it uh, easily navigable, which also allows for better drainage. Um, that, that's really everything, Chris. Oh, sir. Uh, um, it's, it's something that we're considering. There is a, uh, the date isn't specifically published yet, but towards the end of July, uh, the land management plan is going to an update, and part of that update is having a public meeting. Um, the, so I'll keep you in the loop, I'll definitely put you on the, um, the invite list. It's going to be, I'll be having um, postings at each of the trails as well. So there'll be the information there. Um, it'll likely be at that equestrian community center, uh, South of Hills Miller Road in the evening. Um, so feel free to come there and, and that can be you know, part of the traffic alignment as well. 
Awesome. Thank you, Chris. And um, I also, so I, I shared my link to, to the meeting here with a friend of mine, Ben. So I think it looks like there's two of me on here, but one of them is ah. Ben. So sorry about that, guys. I think he might have some comments, so I'm not sure. So we got, we got a couple other ones. Um, are you good for now? Do you have anything else? Left? Yeah, I'm good. I appreciate the time. Thank you, guys. Uh, I have the uh, I have an email question um, from uh, on behalf of the Matanzas Riverkeeper. It is having to do with airboat traffic on Moses Creek. Uh, on and they are their concern is is um, that the airboats are extremely loud and disruptive to nesting birds. It is not uncommon for airboats to enter Moses Creek several times per week, scaring away all the birds that nest along the shore. It also appears that the airboats are taking shortcuts into Moses Creek and have filled large patches of marsh grass that used to make up the entrance of the creek. Um, and they ask, for these reasons, we, we request um, the district consider prohibiting airboat traffic on Moses Creek Conservation Area. That's Brian again. Unfortunately, Moses Creek itself is sovereign waters, and that's not our jurisdiction at all. Um, unfortunately, I, I have heard from uh, one other person about the airboat tours, possibly tours actually, um, taking place out there, but we don't have jurisdiction over the sovereign water. If they're, if they're doing damage to the marsh grasses, I'm not sure. Um, down at the mouth, if that's part of the NUR or not, that might might be helpful to talk to the GTM NUR to get their input on it. Uh, they they do a lot in the marsh grasses down there. I know monitoring and such, so we can reach out to them and ask ask what they what they're seeing. But we cannot control our boat traffic or any boat traffic on Moses Creek. I've been almost swamped in my kayak on that creek fishing when a when a large center console came flying up the creek. So I, I I understand the aggravation, but unfortunately there's not much we can do about it. I it might it might be helpful to ask the county if they have any noise ordinances or times of operation type things. I know some counties uh limit or or municipalities limit airboats uh after certain hours and whatnot. So the St. John's County Audubon has the same question. Um, I'll I'll get both Lauren and, and Amy uh, information for the NER, for the the Guatemala, um, the Kansas NER, uh, and and I think Brian's suggestion is potentially going to uh, the, the county for um, yeah for, for even localized urban restrictions. Uh, might be the best uh, might be the best option. Let's see who else. So I'm gonna go to uh, Newton Cook. Newton, you have your hand raised. I'm gonna go and unmute you, and then unmute yourself too. Okay? Okay, thanks very much, guys. Uh, I don't attend the northern meeting very often. Obviously, I'm down south, and I don't claim to be an expert up there. Uh, but I know we have a couple of people online. Uh, I, we do have a small farm there just north of Rodman uh, near Palaka. And uh, I like to see the, the work that you guys do out there. I uh, killed a few gators on orange. So, But what I'm concerned about is Apaka. And I know we went through this not too long ago with Lake Apaka, but uh, we're still with the second plan that came back out. Uh, we're spraying way too much of the uh, submerged aquatic vegetation. I mean, you guys and all of us have worked for 20 years. Some of you hadn't for 20 years, but I have on Lake Apaka. And I went there the first time. It was a mud hole. It was horrible. It looked worse than coffee. There was a little strand of vegetation no bigger than a chair in the whole lake. And over the years, the hydrilla came back, and guess what? Now we have a great duck hunting and we have great bass fishery. 
We have all the good things we ever wanted for Lake Apopka, and we're spraying recently a plan, 8,000 of the 9,000 acres of SAV. Don't do that. That's what brought the lake back. We need at least 30% of that 30,000 acre lake in SAV. That's around 10,000 acres of SAV in that lake. That needs to be the plan that you guys have for that lake. It will make it another world-class fishery and even a good place to hunt ducks. So that's my number one concern. Uh, just real quickly, I know we all are under horrible pressure to knock that dam down on Lake Wadman. Uh, as you all know, that's 90% from outside of the area. Uh, if that dam had been proposed when I was around, I would have been against it, totally against it. But today it's there. There's that tremendous Rodman, Lake Rodman fishery. And I tell people that if they want to see what will happen, if you knock the dam down, where the beautiful lake is today will be nothing but a horrible, horrible, messy, reedy, wet wasteland for years and years and years to come. It will not be the forest that they think it will be. And again, thanks to what you guys do. I have some great folks up there that deal with you. And uh, I know Steve Pasteur and uh, others, uh, just great folks. And thank you very much. All right, thank you, Newton. Um, Ron, or, or I know that's kind of outside of Jeremy's area. Do you have anything for to make a pop over for uh, Robin? I know Robin. Well, Robin, the decision to take Robin down, I believe, is well, I know it's not within my bureau, <laughs> our bureau. Uh, and I know the district did uh, compile quite a few comments of, or, for DEP. All we were was the conduit for the public comment section. And, and it's really the states uh, that's their ballywick uh, to muddle through, I guess. And uh, similarly, Newton, the Lake Apopka, Spring Lake Apopka is not our jurisdiction. Uh, that's all FWC. Uh, I know they were out there this morning. I thought that they knocked down what they were spraying considerably from the 8,000 acres to a few thousand, but I may, may not be accurate on that number. Yes, the Newton, both of those are kind of out of our, the, out of our main jurisdiction, but I did note the comments and uh, I appreciate you attending too. And uh, it's always good to work with, working with Steve. Steve, I'm sure it's been really good contact for us on, on, our, on our, in this area. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, um, on the uh, on the question box, I have. Do you have scheduled? Uh, uh, do you have a schedule for upcoming timber harvest on uh, Bayard Conservation Area? Um, Paul, do you have anything or or Tyler? Yes, we're we're uh, we just closed on the. Uh... Fuelwood project there on County Road 222, close to the fire station and behind the, the Baptist Church. Uh, that's going to be about a 60 acre project to fuel wood, harvest hardwoods, and reduce the number of hardwoods for sandhill restoration. And also, we'll be thinning uh, some pockets of dense pine within that 60 foot, that 60 acre footprint. You feel like within the next year that that will happen? I mean, that is that is a twelve month contract. I think that will happen happen soon, uh, probably uh, within the next three months. Thank you, Paul. We got another question for Bayard uh, on Bayard Conservation Area uh, and the WMA, the banks of the St. John's River function as the boundary 
However, the tree line is not well marked and there's ambiguity uh, in the definitive copy line. Can you please clarify what constitutes the start of the WMA along the St. John's River, i.e. mean high tide? And, and to follow up with that, does the district have any plans to clearly mark that boundary? Jeremy or Tyler or Brian, you all have any? Yeah, this is Jeremy. Um, yeah, the sovereign, sovereign lines can be tricky to mark, um, but yeah, we can go out there and, and take a look at where the signs are and, and reevaluate that. If, um, if you can email us with specific areas that, that uh, are confusing, we can, we can go take a look at it. Jared, if you want to email me, I'm going to put my email in the answer, um, if we have specific areas you'd like for us to look at, we're not going to pull it from the, to the northern region. Um, you know, I had a couple people with their hands raised. And, Richard Wright, you're, you're recognized. If you just want to unmute. Uh, hey, can you all hear me right now? I hear you, Richard. How are you? All right. Not bad. How are you today, sir? Yeah. Uh, my name's Richard Wright. I'm a resident of St. John's County up over here by Orangedale. I um, also lead uh, the North St. John's Mountain Bike Development Group. Uh, so our general goal is just access similar to Bay Yard Conservation Area and some of the other areas that are, um, that organizations such as Soar Bay, Southern Mountain Bike Off-Road uh, develop. What we'd really love to see is, I know it's still three years out, but 12 mile swamp, uh, some sort of Northern access. We've conducted surveys up here with the population. And I think I've shared some of that to Chris, but, uh, just there's a lot of interest in opening that up and um, just additionally additional district lands such as Bayard. One question I have is some of the trail system on that, just the single path, just from wear and tear, vehicle traffic, horse traffic, some of it's really flooded out and just needs a little TLC, especially since some of the logging from there and also Gord Island as well. Richard, yeah, so um, once the, the lease runs out with Rainier, who's the principal holder for, uh, like what we talked about for, and what you mentioned, for a uh, 12 mile, that'll kind of, what well, one, determine if we become the lead manager or uh, the other possibility is support for service. Once that kind of goes, we get, once that becomes solidified, then a stronger recreation plan can be developed from there. Uh, and so, so the other main parts is potential just road repairs. It's kind of leveling out those areas uh, for um, Bayard and Gord. Is that, is that, that was your other concern, correct? I'm going to unmute you again just to make sure I got it right. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Some of the, just some of it just from wear and tear has like kind of turned into there's always some area, you know, when it rains, it's going to be wet and damp. But the areas I'm talking about is just where it's to the point where the roadway is about as knee deep of swamp. And then it causes traffic to divert to the left, the right, increasing the swamp, you know, degrading the habitat too. it just where it's kind of like a cut instead of like a tabletop road. It just naturally has that water pooling there and then with traffic. It just needs a little little work in a couple areas. I would say 90% of it is good to go. It's just in a few small areas. I just wanted to bring that attention. Same thing with Bayard. Uh, 
excuse me, I just got Bayard's one and then the other one I mentioned, Gord Island, just where they got done logging. The initial road headed out has got some large ruts just from uh, the logging operation there. And I understand right now is we're about to hit kind of the wetter season, not the best time, maybe have to wait till winter, but I just wanted to bring it up to the district's attention. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate it. Um, Tyler, uh, Jeremy, do you have anything? I mean, is that kind of on the, more of the list? I know, I, I know it's extensive. It always is. But. City issues. Um, can you guys hear me? I got you now. I'm sorry, I had you muted. So, uh, uh, okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, if next time it, we have a heavy rain, I'll go out there and look and see where those problem spots are. Um, and uh, we we may be able to do something. We're just going to have to make sure that it's not going to uh, affect the hydrology of the site. Um, you know, it, it sometimes we're building up a road or, or uh, you know, if there are low water crossings and we leave those in place so that, um, you know, water can flow uh, across the site like it, it needs to, to maintain that ecological um, integrity. Um, so we'll have to take a look and, uh, and see what we can do about that. Thanks, Tom. And uh, another hand raised, Michelle Curtis. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and unmute yourself. Please. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? I can. Okay. Um, my name is Michelle Curtis, and I'm a forester. Been practicing forestry in uh, Florida and Georgia for 44 years now. I'm also the uh, vice president of the North Florida um, Backcountry Horsemen's Association. So. My interest today as we talk is, is about um, uh, equestrian use of public lands. And so we just wanted to really make some general comments for your consideration as you plan your future recreational activities on the various properties. Um, first of all, some of the parking is an issue for people hauling horses because the horse trailers um, you know, aren't as agile so, as say an individual truck, for example. And, um, and so we just ask if you, if you could, as you plan your parking facilities, make it such that we can pull in and you know, turn around and, and be positioned to pull out. It's just a, a logistical issue as far as not putting up barriers to have very organized parking that would keep a horse trailer from being able to turn around. Excuse me, I'm sorry, my personal phone here at the house is wrong. Um, the other item would be um, trail. Ideally, we would not have horse trails um, on the same of the conflicts there. Uh, we some of our people do ride where there's bicycles, but it is um, hazardous really for everyone's health truly to have bikes and horses on the same trails. Um, the other thought would be um, primitive camping would be highly desired, and here's why. Um, if you're hauling horses to ride for a day, you can pretty much maybe go two counties to have, and then you can ride and come back home. Um, if there's not camping available, you really can't go further than two counties away from wherever your home is. Um, and, and ideally it'd be every other county. But um, so we, the primitive camping is important to us. And, and the uh, equestrians, um, basically we conduct ourselves to leave no trace behind. We'll take out whatever we bring in. We can put up little portable pens. We can tie our horses to our trailers, that kind of thing. Um, so we're just requesting your consideration for uh, primitive camping sites. Now, we most of the people that do primitive camping with horses have contained sanitary sewer facilities in the little campers and such. So that's not a huge deal for us, but it's not a problem to have just a portal bed. So we don't need fancy restroom facilities or things of that sort for um, being able to use it, use it. Ideally, it would be wonderful to have a source of water for the horses, you know, just one spigot at least, but it's not mandatory. We can bring our own water if we need. 
need to, but it, ideally we would like to have a water source for drinking water for them. And, um, and then the other thing, we want to offer our support and services to help maintain the trails. Uh, we're very willing to work with our various organizations across North Florida to trim trails, um, you know, at work with the district um, to perform various things to, to maintain trails, uh, mark the trails once you agree on routes, even potentially um, suggest uh, potential new trail additions. Um, and ideally, you know, personally, I would love to see at least 10 miles of trail on each property because um, horses move quite a bit faster than walkers. And so um, if you only have five miles of trail, you can do that in, you know, like two hours. So it's not, uh, it's a very short ride. So um, I think those were the comments I, I wanted to make. We really, really appreciate you um, getting input from the public and considering that as you make your plans for the future. And we, we welcome the opportunity to work with you and support you in maintenance of the trails or what have you. Thanks, Michelle. Can you repeat, uh, it was breaking up, there was like your second point about potentially multi-use trails. Oh, okay. Um, horses and um, bicycles don't mix very well. Um, and it can be hazardous to the horse person's health. I mean, you know, because if the horse is, are spooked by a bicycle coming by very quickly or what have you, um, you know, that can create an accident. So um, we're just suggesting, you know, you could, even if they're, you know, 10 or 20 feet apart, that's okay. It's not a problem. It's just when they're on the same trail, um, it is, it's, it's problematic. And were there any specific parking um, lots you're speaking of? No, and I tell you truly, Nancy Stevens, the president, uh, right. and I have had an opportunity to, excuse me, um, have not had an opportunity to go and visit all the sites, you know, since we received the invitation for this webinar. Uh, but we would be glad to do that um, site and give you site specific suggestions on that. Thank you. Um, okay. In, in general, the we don't have i think any campsites that have portalettes with them and most of our campsites are designed it would be difficult to have a trailer go through it um so that that's without expanding them greatly i, I can't think of a lot of like like definitely maybe um, horseback ride into the campsite and camp there but i can't think of anything Outside of that, as far as the, the camping potential for camping sites, or, or right. the, even the current primitive camping sites, as far as the capacity to um, get, you probably get a smaller horse trailer, but some of these larger horse trailers are like fifth wheel or um, right. That, that would be a difficult. Um, right. Brian, did you have anything besides that? Um, no, I mean, I think that covers it. I, uh, I can't address the camping if you were, for, if, if you're equating um, primitive camping to uh, sleeping in a sleeping quarters in a horse trailer, that's that's prohibited by our 40C-9 uh, land management rule. Uh, if primitive camping as defined in our rule is tent camping. Okay. And so why would that be um, prohibitive? I mean, it's actually less um, invasive, I would think, when you have everything contained within your your trailer. Well, we don't have the infrastructure to even get the horse trailers into the woods to where the campsites are. Uh, it's, it's way too tight, so that's one reason. Uh, we do have an issue uh, that has been on the increase since the pandemic with people living out of their you know, the van life uh, situation, which those are considered RVs and they're camping in our parking lots. And we're, we just ordered the thousands of dollars worth of signs to post in our parking areas, to, uh, notifying people that camping in our parking areas is a violation of 40C-9, which is indeed a misdemeanor. Um, right. 
uh, it's kind of become a rampant problem. We're, we're just oh. not built for that kind of camping. That's, you know, that we leave that to the state parks and the right. national forest. Uh -huh. We're just so offering a different type of experience. Right, and I, and I understand that. And I think all we're doing is asking for your consideration for the future, because when you've got a large um, acreage of, of 1,000 acres, 10,000 acres, um, your camp, your existing camping is a very, very small part of that, as well as the, the trails. I mean, having been a land manager on many thousands of acres for many years, um, pretty, pretty small footprint. And we're just asking for truly a couple acres uh, two acres of clear, clear park uh, that could be used for horse trailers and primitive camping, and we would remove everything. We don't take, leave anything behind. So we're just asking your consideration as you plan future uses of um, the public owned property that you would also plan in the equestrian use as well. Absolutely. Appreciate it, Michelle. We appreciate the work that you did at the Bay Yard. Thank you. you did at the parking lot then at Bay Yard. Thank you very much for the opportunity to give the input. Yeah. Paul, got another question about the Moses Creek uh, timber harvest. Do you have any more details on that, similar to what uh, you kind of gave for Bayo? Which which harvest? Um, Moses Moses Creek. Creek. Do we do we have anything coming up at Moses Creek, and, then, and if so? Um, some detail. Yeah, Tyler's working on a potential fuel wood harvest uh, that's just now being developed, uh, and he hasn't actually put it together yet. But that's that's upcoming. Yes, yes. Um, so I wouldn't expect that uh, to happen uh, you know, within the next. Um, I'll say six months or so, but where we're looking at is along the northern boundary, um, uh, be due west of the marsh line out there at Moses, uh, probably, I'd say a half a mile. Um, it's not a, a very big area. Um, we're probably talking, uh, you know, 100 acres or less, um, but it'll be out there in the very far north of uh, the property. Um, and we're looking at, at doing some of the same kind of restoration uh, that we've done at other properties, getting hardwoods um, off of sand hills so that we can uh, go in there and, and um, you know, get more longleaf and kind of return the area back to what it naturally should be. Next time, did have another question, it's kind of like a more of a comment regarding um, some of the single use trails on Bayard, just having ruts. So I, th I think um, Tyler and, and you know, addressed that earlier, just kind of going out when it's, when it's finding those those areas that might be uh, lower, but at least also considering that there just might be low spots in those, um, making sure we're not impacting hydrology. Fletcher, do you have anything else? I, I see you got your hand raised. Sorry, I I didn't mean to have it raised. Yeah, is it? Do you think it's the other? Sorry. I'm not sure if it's you the um the one you shared the link with. Let's see. Either one of you on mute. Yeah, it could be Ben. It's not me. I'm not sure if it's maybe the other Fletcher. Sorry. No, it's all good. Hey, good morning. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I got you now. Hey, outstanding. Yeah, it's the other Fletcher. Ben here. Yeah. So, hey, good morning, guys. I appreciate you putting on this meeting. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank you guys for all the hard work that you are putting in. It is evident. 
Um, not as much for me just because I've been gone so much over the last two years. Um, I'm a Clay County resident, also active duty Navy. Um, been gone a majority of my time here. I am a Florida resident, um, just stationed here, but over in this side of the state, I have noticed a lot of outdoor opportunities um, and I would like to see those keep coming. Um, I know a lot of people that do take advantage of that and a lot of them uh, due to hours, due to different things going on in life, aren't able to necessarily make a lot of these meetings. So that's why, you know, we always kind of talk back and forth and try and get at least a couple of us to get in here, show face, that kind of thing. Um, so that kind of brings me down to, we were talking at the beginning of the meeting, you know, essentially a third of the, um, a third of the St. John's Water Management District lands are kind of open to public access, hunting, fishing, horseback riding, all these different outdoor recreation activities. Um, well, I just wanted to kind of drop that bug in the earth. I'd like to see more of that other two thirds, you know, start opening up. And I do understand um, we don't necessarily have the kind of structure in place, the manpower, uh, the funding, et cetera, to get all two thirds open. And I get that. <clears throat> Not to mention, you know, you don't want somebody uh, out there necessarily using or potentially abusing that whole other two thirds. And I get that also. Um, so with that being said, one thing that I would like to bring up and kind of put out there is whether the young lady that was talking about with the horseback riders you know there's multiple other organizations other entities other groups of people that are more than willing to help volunteer time volunteer resources volunteer equipment um whether it be seed you know we were talking about some of the different uh working at the university of florida for some of these different projects there's a lot of other options to kind of help that manpower and get people involved with these outdoor activities and places that they can go recreate at so I think that's one thing where kind of the squeaky wheel gets the grease. I understand, like you're saying a second ago, the glamping situation, you guys spent, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to go get all these signs made to put up in parking lots. Um, that's all fine and dandy. However, a lot of that can be alleviated um, through, again, that squeaky wheel getting the grease, you know, be vocal about it. Hey, we're seeing this issue. We're seeing this issue. We're seeing this issue. And some of that can kind of um, fix itself you know, with everybody working back and forth. Um, I know that on the outdoorsman side, like I said, it's, I've been a part of many uh, kind of tailgate meetings, you know, where somebody saw something that, you know, somebody littered or somebody, you know, did that, this, that, or the other, and somebody correct them, said, hey, don't leave that there, pick it up. And again, just like our horseback rider was saying, if you bring it in, pack it out. That's, you know, firmly believe in that. Um, and I don't know very many outdoorsmen that you know do leave a lot of stuff like that and i think it's one of those things that as we see it we can correct it and kind of alleviate some of that pressure on you guys so i would i do have to kind of back the horseback rider yeah i don't really see an issue with somebody staying in their horse trailer like i said pack it in pack it out i i understand you know if you got somebody coming in there tearing the place up leaving a bunch of trash bags everywhere um yeah that's certainly an issue but again you know, there, there's ways we can be vocal about that. There's other ways to correct that um, without just throwing a big blanket rule out there. Nope, nobody's allowed to go out there and do these things. Um, and again, like I said, I've been gone. I haven't been privy to that entire conversation, but I would love to learn more about it. Um, I was just doing kind of some simple math and looking at things um, just over around Hastings, like uh, Fletch was talking about. You know, there's thousands and thousands of acres over there that, um, only one of those areas really gets any heavy use through other types of non-consumptive users and recreators. Um, but the other two areas, including Deep Creek, like so there, there's a lot of land up there, a lot of opportunities available. Um, and as far as that, um, kind of some of the, the storm debris and things like that getting cleared out, I for one, I've got a boat, I've got a chainsaw, like I said, and if it's gonna allow me to kind of open that up, um getting through there by, via boat access that's i'm willing to do that one it's going to be better for the for the kind of flood staging and such as well as like I said, it's going to open up other activities and i'm not talking about going there and cutting a bunch of live stuff we're talking about just deadfall you know stuff that came down with a storm so again that kind of goes back to that volunteer thing that i was talking about people are willing to work we just have to get a vocal to get out there and help you guys whether that's you guys just you know send out a flyer send out a leaflet you know, or talk to some of the kind of pillars in the community, so to so to speak. Um, there there are people out there to help. We just, 
you know, it's got to be got to be put out um, or through the venues that are going to get a little bit more notice. Um, I know I've been following the kind of conservation scene for many, many years now, all the way from here in my home state of Florida, all the way out to California, where I was stationed for almost a decade. There's again, it's it's a common trend. There's a lot of people willing to work. It just the telephone game kind of trickles down and the message doesn't get delivered. So if we can find a little bit better way to deliver that, like so I know we can get some manpower. It's not gonna be an army of people, but any and all help is good help. Um yeah, that's other than that. Like so I'm here to see the love to see the great work. Love I think you guys are doing a wonderful job um let's let's get a little bit more of that land opened up i'd love to see that um and i think there's some good ways to do that like so without overburdening yourselves or anybody else but i'd really like to see that thank all for your time appreciate it ben and um the lead i don't i know jeremy's been on the numbers on it and i believe correct me if i'm wrong i think it's 95 percent of our properties are open to the public with WMA's on 75% of it? Uh, I think it's like, six, I, I want to say 68% WMA's. I'm not positive on that. Okay. percent. Yeah, that's about right. And then, uh, yeah, this is Jeremy. And um, we have some properties that um, aren't aren't big enough for WMA that we allow the, the special hunts that Amy mentioned with the Turkey Federation and the youth hunts and veteran hunts as well. Um, always open for more ideas and um, the point, uh, you know, users on the properties, um, seeing things and reporting things, that, that's a really good point. Something we've really uh, benefited from in the past is having, um, you know, good stewards out there, uh, public users that are aware of the rules and um, willing to report bad things that they see. We've made some really good cases with our partner partners at FWC um, from the porch from the public. So that's a that's a good point. Appreciate it. Hey, you're speaking of uh, those ideas real quick, um, especially the smaller parcels of land. Um, I know the one thing I have seen in some of the uh, kind of Midwest and even more Northeast states, they, you know, they've got urban bow hunts, you know, they've got and they can be they'll be less than 100 acres. Um, so it's certainly possible. I know it's possible. I've seen it. Um, so I understand, yeah, again, you don't want a rifle hunter out there, you know, in small parts of the land, I get that 100%. Uh, there's a lot of safety issues to go into that. Um, but again, there are other means, like I said, i.e. some of those urban hunts, some small game hunts with shotguns, bows and arrows. Again, those don't have a very far range. Um, so it's, there's opportunities. I think there's ways that, you know, we can talk, we can discuss and um, open up some, some of those even smaller parcels you know, without just going full on overboard. So, about it, thank you. And it is a mix, like we do have, as evidence today, there's a lot of different users um, that we have to try and balance. And, and recreation is just one part of, of our overall mission. And, and our main mission is ecological restoration and recreation is a component of it, but it's, uh, we're gonna listen. And, uh, um, Make some adjustments as well, like where they fit. Uh, that was the main part of it. Do you get an email question? From Chris, can I can I jump in real quick about yes. uh, the Deep Creek and uh, the the deadfall? Yeah. On Deep Creek? Ben, ben, uh, yeah, that's a traditional. Uh, navigable waterway and um, it might be worth reaching out to the Army Corps. I know they have uh, machines that can that can uh, take care of that kind of stuff I and mean, it's the same stuff you see going on uh, after hurricanes along riverbanks. Um, you know if if you think there's a navigational hazard in there I would I would definitely see uh, if you could uh, get in touch with the Army Corps and Chris well, I'll share my email here in the in the message. If you'd like to email me, Ben, um, I could uh, I could maybe help get that ball rolling. I have a couple of contacts in the Army Corps, so I'll throw my email in there real quick. All right, thank you. I would greatly appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, I knew there was one more component of that of, of Ben's comment. So um, 
Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, anything else, Ben? No, no, that's yeah. Those those are kind of my talking points. Yeah. Um, one, listen to some of the other other uh, users and speakers, and then also like so some things that are kind of on the back burner with me. So yeah, we can certainly reach out to the Army Corps of Engineers, see what they've got to say about it, see if there's anything that they can kind of use. I understand they pull from a little bit different resources yes. and funding, a um, little bit rule book, a little different rule book. Very much so. their mission as well, as far as maintaining navigable waterways. Um, and Colin put his email in the chat box. So if you if you check out the chat box, there's his email is there. T Motel at SJRWP. All right, that sounds good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, had a um, question in, in coming into email. Is it possible to add the prescribed fire notices to the district website webpage prior to the burn? And um, also regarding Bayard, uh, four wheelers are coming onto the property at the former uh, State Road 16 West entrance. There's an opening next to the gate that's wide enough for them to fit through. Um, so it's it's difficult to to really be able to um, make sure that there are times where, where we we have pretty good assurances the day before that there's a fire happening, but by and large we're waiting for a, a, the three o'clock kind of weather um, to confirm uh, our plans for the next day. So generally, the, the weather comes out um, in the afternoon, and then we start going from there. Our our district website is really good about making announcements in the morning. Um, the the Compton is good. Uh, it's been also putting it on on our various social media outlets as well. That would be the best um, way to uh, quickly see if there's a if there's a prescribed fire at conservation area that you're looking to go to. Um, you can also call our office and uh, I'll, I'll put that in, in our, our, our office number. It's 386-329-4404. Uh, and then you can check and see, um, generally know the morning of uh, as opposed to the afternoon. And as far as the the four wheelers coming onto the property, that kind of goes to what um, Ben was just talking about and, and having other, other folks seeing what's out there. Um, Tyler, are you uh, aware of that? Most likely you are, and, and, and if so, you have ways to kind of deal with that. You're on mute, Tyler. Okay. Um, yeah, so with my experience, uh, you're never going to keep four wheelers off. We'll go out there and and uh, and try to uh, see where that that fence is. Um, my email again's in that chat box. If uh, if you have a specific location, uh, it'd be great to know. Um, you know. We we have three people again and 42,000 acres, so sometimes we don't see everything. Um, our contracted uh, security firm, uh, they they do a good job um, and if we can get them some info to where they can they can catch these people that that in my experience is about the only thing that that really deters it it's it's usually people that live right around the area and the word gets out quick if somebody gets a citation um, and that's really uh, what can curb that um, we definitely want to keep fences up um, to kind of deter the people that may have it in their mind. Well, I don't know if this is a good idea or not. Uh, so we do need, we'll get that fixed, but, um, yeah, getting them caught is, is the most important thing. So if you see something like that, uh, you call Clay County Sheriff's office, um, get them out there and, and get them a citation. You know, that'll, that'll help out a lot. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate it. I had another question on approximately 2,000 acres of district land are currently connected to existing WMAs, but not included in these WMAs. Why were these areas not included in the WMAs? 
and what can be done to include them. Uh, 400 acres adjacent to Bayard south of Williams Park Road, 886 acres of Thomas Creek Kings Road unit, and uh, 703 acres next to Four Creek. I believe the ones at Thomas Creek are co-owned by the city of Jacksonville, and some of that was in the management agreement. Um, where there may not, not even isn't necessarily allowed in that management area. Um, the one in Bayard, I'm not familiar with, and, and I'm not sure if y'all have other information. Jerry Bryan is retired. I think that yeah. Thomas Creek one, one might be um, Ogilvy Betts, which uh, we have access issues on, but we're working with. That's right. Yeah. That, so, so the, yeah, the Thomas Creek, or the one next to Four Creek. Yeah, there's no, there's no legal access. But we have, an, we have the access easement that we have is is just for district personnel. Um, and uh, yeah, I believe the other one, the King's Road unit, has an, an agreement on it uh, that limits what we can do. Um, Tyler, you got something for uh, Bayard? Yeah, um, I'm not positive why that, that southern area is not open, but we do reevaluate those things every year, and we'll definitely have that in consideration, I believe, uh, and see where that can go. Um, but uh, we, we'll look into that. We're kind of looking into um, a lot of a lot of different uh, areas where uh, it, it may be uh, feasible uh, for uh, access. So we'll, we'll have to to dig down deeper and and see what uh, see what we can do there. Thanks, John. Uh, Fletcher had a question on expanding the access issue, expanding on the access issue at Thomas Creek. Um, it's just, I think it's through the cemetery or through um, an existing neighbor's property is the actual on-road access. Um, I'm not sure if you're asking about uh, coming from the waterway. Uh, Fletcher. Okay. Right on mute, Joe. Fletcher, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm here now. Thanks. Uh, I couldn't unmute, unmute myself. Um, no. Yeah, that was. That's what I was wondering. Uh, you pretty much hit it. And the neighbors are through a cemetery. Um, that makes sense. I appreciate it. Yeah. It looks like it looks like this might be it. Um, don't have any other uh, questions via email. Seems like everyone is hands down. Is there any? Anything else? If, if there's any, if there's any other questions by y'all, probably the quickest way to do it is to raise your hand at this point. Richard, do you have anything else? I'm on YouTube real quick. So see you again. Richard Rock. That's it. I think that's it, everyone. Um, if you have any other questions uh, that come up in the future, please email Northern Recreation Comments at sjrwmd.com or um, well, myself, C. Kinsler. At, at, WM, at srwmd.com and um, this will be posted on our YouTube page here uh, 
next couple of days. And I really appreciate everybody participating. I appreciate all our staff for putting this together. It's no small feat and a, and a, and a component of their already extremely busy uh, workloads and lives. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for, for participating. I think we'll have a wonderful year. And uh, of course, feel free to reach out with any additional questions. With that, I'll be ending the webinar and everybody have a great day.